Hello there and welcome to The Value of Everything. So this is part one of a three-hour interview with Francis Hunt. Predominantly in this first segment, we are analysing the current state of affairs and where are the potential pitfalls. Please note this was recorded on the 21st of October 2016. Now let me pass you over. Thanks for coming back to the show, Francis. Absolute pleasure. Delighted to be here with you. If this is anything like our prior conversation, I think we're going to be on to a good one. So if you don't mind, shall we dive into the deep end? Absolutely, Charles. Just like to get your beginning thoughts as to with the economy states, are we heading towards a great reset or a slow dying illness? I think you've narrowed it down to the primary uh, options there. There is certainly no great recovery that I can see, all be us being regularly sold as such a, a narrative. So it is probably the two to choose from. The one thing that will always bias me to the former, the reset option, is that things get disorderly regardless of what people's intentions are. The nature in which things grind their way up is very different to how they unwind. What tends to happen is fear and greed leads to stampedes. The failure of the system leads to, or or the beginning of the unraveling of the system leads to very defensive measures which are then trigger a domino flow of events that immediately perpetuate the crisis. So it has an accelerating, it has a kinetic energy that self-feeds on itself that becomes out of control for even the best wishing central bank to prevent from unraveling. So I don't actually think that you get away with the full slow death. Currently, however, it has to be said, so far in perception, everything is being done to attempt to make this a controlled descent. And we are pretty sclerotic. You know, we've got a bad liver and we're looking a bit yellow. But on the surface, it appears for now that um, we're in the slow descent mode. But the problem with that is that the rot is under the skin and it's behind the system and it's not visible. And you suddenly go into a stroke and you roll over. So we are the guy with a bad liver looking real yellow and looking well older than his years. But it does accelerate, I'm afraid, in my view on balance of probabilities. Yeah. So the main purpose of this is for us to go through the uh, the turning points in the economy. I'm trying to span us out into different phases. So one of the main points is like the current one, which is happening within this year. The next one is like a midterm, which is going from year one to five years time. And then we go beyond that. So what is happening into the future? So they're the main areas. Thank you so much for just covering the premise. Just as you take a position on being like a, a chartist, I think this would be fascinating to hear your thoughts. You've probably outlaid this before in the past, but when it comes to the end of a boom cycle, how would you describe significant patterns which happen to volume, volatility, participation, from the buyers or the bulls perspective, as well as the sellers and the bears. How how does that, that boom cycle start to, like a, a rocket going into the air, how does that start to explode and fall down? How does that happen? You've encapsulated quite a bit of a good analogy even in, in within that yourself, because you're asking about all the right areas. You mentioned volatility, you mentioned volume, and I think you went so far as to describe, although you may not have said the word hyperbolic, you know, the blow off of a major market. The value of being a technical person that looks at charting of indicators, as well as being macro fundamental economically interested in having seen also the psychological responses of the crowd in the dot com mania, the subprime, et cetera, is that I get to see uh, these kind of events from many different manifestations. So I'm looking into the room, not just through the keyhole, but through a window on an, at a different angle. And it does allow one to get a more rounded perspective, a sort of 360 degree understanding. Typically at a chart, which is the technical analysis side, is often near a dying market, you get what's called a melt up. We had that in the dot com. We probably had that here in the UK house prices leading into 2007. Um, you know, we started to get deep into the double digits, annual returns back to back. It became a sure thing and almost too good each time. And also the volume 
expands initially. So both the volatility, you're getting a very fast stretchy move, you're closing a lot higher on the candle in terms of the average property price at the end of the year than you started it. So you're getting that expansiveness in the price move. Yep. And the people that are engaging in the game, volume-wise, are growing. So it's no longer an early adopter thing. The mainstream has all been getting access now to buy to let. More people are being sucked into the base of the pyramid to sustain the price acceleration. So lending is being proliferated at a far greater level. So ordinary people, you know, I, I had the benefit of being in property development during that period because to me it was a long trade with a long period of sustained low interest rates where lending was becoming more expandedly available so i only saw a big move up yes. and we eventually had you know an unranked police officer being given 2 million pound buy to let money cash to spend on apartments you know just by virtue of not having a bad credit record and so you could literally be a constable and be on £24,000, and you were being levered up immensely. So this is the sign of the expansion of the base of the pyramid to get new blood in to sustain what's already been achieved. And of course, developers are full steam ahead, so they're grabbing land sites everywhere and anywhere because they have been responding in kind to what's already been a sustained bull market that is now going into melt-up state. And these are usually should be your warnings. But you risk being too early if you're the kind of person who wants to short sell. But what you should certainly not be doing is not being part of the dumb money coming in. It's a bit cruel to say the dumb money, but unfortunately, it often turns out the people that have never been in that business that have now been sucked in it, they've been hearing about it in the dinner tables of everyone else who's made X, Y, and Z on the property and decides, I can't bear to be out. Yeah. The pain of being out and looking like the guy who's missing the bus and everyone's saying, why are you such an idiot? And almost peer pressure, the, the most awkward trade is the one nobody else gives you any respect for. And also the most awkward trade of doing nothing, the inertia, is when everyone else has done something and you're the one not and you're listening to all their gains. So the people who are buying Apple, you know, four, five, six years ago and what, you still haven't got it, whatever the office banter is, if it's a stock trading floor or whatever. So you feel that pressure. That's what I call the herding 91 percenter, the momentum chaser. And that happens at the melt-ups. So technically, I've given you some psychology. I've given you a chart basis, and the volume tends to expand because the base of the pyramid to sustain the additional supply that's coming online has to expand rapidly to keep the big numbers coming. And that's what I'd call melt up and blow off market. Right. And it's a very serious warning sign when you have a runaway market. And you would have seen it if you look at the NASDAQ.com era. And the volatility is highly expansive. But at the, that point, it's mainly up. Once you get to a certain level, then you start to get wild gyrating swings where there seem to be gaps in that supply now. And then suddenly there's a small panics from people that are already fundamentally wary about how much it's moved. But then you get some late bulls and it swings back up. And then you start to get governmental concerns often about the market potentially crashing. So you get sort of schemes where we'll buy unwanted stock, you know, and we'll turn it into social housing. The minute you start to hear about stabilizers having to come in or buyers of last resort like parastatal, which are actually taking taxpayer money, you know you are already deep into concern behind closed doors, period. So, you know, your man with the bad liver and the yellow skin is breathless and he's going into his doctor and they find out that, you know, he's got no red blood cells or whatever the case may be. Yeah. So that is the very, very sick and an impending disaster awaits. So those are the kind of signs to look for. Excellent. So one of the things I know that you can do with that as well is that you can apply that to pretty much most charts as well, can't you? Because of the, the volumes, the volatility. Volatility and participation become very random as well, don't they, towards the end of a boom cycle? Yes. And you also get what I'd call anecdotal indicators, the, the classic being the shine boy telling you what stocks to buy. And, or you can make that the taxi driver and the other thing. In other words, people that aren't typically involved in a business suddenly are being sucked in and the headline, the domination of the headlines of newspapers, which are all reactive and late and also not necessarily speaking in terms of your interest. So they may actually be 
you know, selling and hoping to keep the ball going on the account of there being a lack of interest. So ramping the market when it most needs a positive news feed, they'll be there to provide it. So sometimes it's just they are late by virtue. It's not a conspiracy to hit the 99%. In other cases, there is PR that wants to keep the boom going. I remember in Manchester, as a mere an anecdote, you know, rentals had to stack and the letting agents that were also doing selling kept holding on that people were going to be paying £1,500 a month in Manchester for these she-she apartments that were being knocked up. And, you know, the average salary around there was about £22,000. Uh, so yeah. as a percentage, they were starting to hold on because they knew they needed to keep talking this game because they needed to keep the developers they were giving them their stock to sell. So in a way, they were coerced into a false narrative to keep you believing. Yeah. And it wasn't necessary that some master brain sat down and built a plan and said, you must lie to the people, otherwise this ends. In other words, the system's capitalistic incentives leads to a closed game where you can't get a true answer and you have to seek raw data from a real source. Yeah, I sometimes quote it as the great disconnect where people are disconnected to like a, a bank manager is really just pushed to sell the loan, but isn't really quite in reality of risk and reward and the risk of the loan not coming in. And there's so many different disconnections with reality that gets applied at this point that it never manifests itself. People are just guided by these false narratives. Well, you mentioned something really interesting there. One of the key issues in the subprime crisis was the creation of securitization. Yeah. I had an incredibly unique view on all of this. A, because I ended up in property development and I watched how people were pushing up valuations and trying to hold on to rents to make the numbers stack. And I was also working for a financial consulting firm to the banks in the post-2000 era. I started in 99 with them right the way through to 05. And we had a report called non-standard lending and it never sold at all. Right. And then I remember it changed name and it became subprime. This was the first time I came across the word, long before anybody in the mainstream would have ever heard of it. And suddenly it started selling a great deal, a subprime mortgaging. We also had a report called securitization and that started to sell. And I don't know, just you know, many, I'm sure your viewers are highly educated, but it's probably just worth explaining what securitization was. And that was the ability of a bank or an originator of a loan to package it into an investment that they no longer owned and would sell off and get a new block of capital to originate new loans from. And investors would then acquire the portfolio of debt. And once you removed the negative downside of the quality of underwriting to the original originator, and you gave him great payment for generating these investments in an environment where there was a search for yield, and Greenspan was pumping liquidity, and there was a lot of money chasing around and not enough yield. Yeah. You actually created the perfect scenario for someone to just be focused on a loan origination and no longer to be worried about underwriting quality. Yeah. And so what that effectively meant is it's somebody else's problem. We've sold it on. Yeah. And of course, it got repackaged and sold to someone else and sliced and diced and sold it. And some of the institutions that were originating them even ended up in their investment arm buying it back in without even knowing. And others just focused on origination and just sold ever more toxic packages into their investment arena. I mean, that is how the subprime crisis was a globalized event. Essentially, we're talking about Detroit, Vegas, and a number of places. And these were sent to Swiss banks, bought by Swiss banks, and the dumb money, the German banks. And they might not forgive me for saying so, but Deutsche was right amongst them and Commerce and all of them, eating trough deep in the, the low interest rate environment, this alleged high yield yeah. um, notion. I'm just going to take and it ties in Sorry. with Brexit, if I can finish this yeah. little parallel, because it's all very interesting. I'm getting a lot of Remainers that are post-traumatized by Brexit. And one of them said, I much preferred being scaled up. It was a safer place to be, right? you know, with the EU zone. And I go, you don't make a problem disappear. If you have one toxic subprime loan, it's better to take your hit on that, on that one loan. You don't create a CDO portfolio package of them and say, they're now triple A rated and it's awesome. Yes. It doesn't go away. All you do is you scale the problem, you make a little bit more space to hide for a little bit longer, and you sit on a bigger hand grenade when it detonates. That notion of scaling and clinging to a thing gives it uh, more strength. 
not all unity is strength. If there's a virus in the system, all you do is you further proliferate it. Yes, absolutely. I'm just going to take you on a very slight juncture here. Would you say that the the point of which all of this disconnection happens is where the corporation lies, where you have directors that really are just trying to earn as much as money as they can and sell off the business to somebody else and then they run away and these corporations lobby to politicians so there is a great disconnect and money motivation which is happening at the higher echelons there is never going to be just a simple one reason why everything failed if we're talking about the subprime crisis as your example in terms of was it just professional management but i certainly believe management that is non-entrepreneurial but gets to be a, a ceo or something or another has a lot to answer for generally but remember something the one of my favorite sayings is you get the society you incentivize yes if you go for short-term incentives and you allow people to bend the game of short-term incentives, you will get that harvest that goes with it. In other words, if you do not value longevity, sustainability, and it's all about quick hit, the definition of a control fraud, which is what happened a lot during the savings and loans crisis, was very much this. And I'll just I'll play out a small scenario and you'll see how it all works. Yeah. I'm a CEO or a CFO of a reasonable size corporate. So I've fought my way up internally. I've never developed the business. I've never done anything particularly special, but I've been a political animal and I've become CEO. I'm charming enough. And I then go to my board and I say, you know what, guys, I'd really like to amp the stock price. You know, I'm here to work for the stockholders and all of this. I have an idea. Can you please set me? And he turns to his remuneration board. A real stretch target. Look, I want it to be real stretch. But if I happen to hit that stretch target, then you just throw the cash at me like never before. I want options. I literally billionaire. There's certain Coke CEOs which actually became billionaires on professional management. And I thought that was excessive. And so I, I set this seemingly fairly stretchy target and I get a friendly remuneration board to say, wow, that's really big. You know, we, we'll, we'll do awesome. We'll give him hundreds of millions of shares if he does that. Yeah. So I then negotiate this seemingly rather unlikely event. And then I go out and I leverage the business. I go borrowing like mad. I scale up like mad. Let's say we're car makers. I get them making cars coming out of their nose. I force the dealers into taking additional stock. I stuff the channel to hell and gone. I force the financial arm like general, let's say I'm General Motors, GMAC to give lending to everyone. We go subprime. A kid who's in college who does pizza flipping on his income, I, he can get a burger because he's studying something relevant. That lady will have a salary, whatever the case may be. I flood liquidity through my financial arm. I really boost those numbers. I get everyone driving Ford Explorers. I throw money at the coolest uh, you know, basketball player of the moment. And I just leverage, leverage, leverage. I take risks. I cut quality to boost margins. I do all sorts of short-termists that are not the good for the sustainability of the business. All I actually do is bring a whole bunch of potential future demand forward into today. Yeah. Destroy the profitability and the sustainability of the brand by leveraging it in and giving everyone the reason to act earlier rather than when their car is doing. Convince government to do a cash for clunker scheme. Let's say I, I coordinate with other car makers. And I ramp it and I smash that goal and objective. And I hollow out all the staff, all the support staff. There's just manufacturing and there's just the dealership network. Support staff, all of it, I make us super profitable. But now the customer complaints start to come in. The product is shoddy. There's no one who answers the phone. People don't care. The culture is not about the client. It's all about the accounting ability to get a maximal earning per share. The stock price in the meantime has shot the moon. The board thinks I'm a god and my options come home. So, and that is essentially a control fraud. After I go, there is a scorched earth policy. There's a shell of a great name with a battered reputation, bad staff, bad customer service. People get thrashed and demotivated, made to work overtime, underpaid. And it is just greed. Yeah. That in its element is an incentive system that is incentivized short-termism and the superstar culture. America is, the, is very much hell-bent on the star principle, not the team or the collective. And they will allow and even indulge. And, it's, and I think it's because that remuneration committee is in on the game and is probably executing similarly. 
Now, the savings and loans crisis was very much a control fraud. It's called a control fraud. In other words, the professional management, through virtue of having control, not ownership, but control, can take action that best benefits them but ends up leading to the detriment of the organization and personal enrichment of himself. That is an example of when I say you get the system or the society that you incentivize. If you allow someone to write his own incentives, as I've done in this argument, or to be to lobby sympathetic ears who would like a similar opportunity themselves and will place me on their remuneration committees, well, you now have an insider cartel. Whether there's someone who's actually sat down and written the charter of how the insiders will rape all the corporations, that's not what's happening. But by nod and wink, we return a good favor for a good favor. Yes. The buddy system. And that then leads to a knock-on effect of a society where actually it is cartelized without it formally ever happening. Because we're all in it for our interests at our peer group level as a CEO of big corporations. And this is how we get to a corporate oligarchy, which we currently have now. Yep. You look at a lot of businesses that are going to the wayside at the moment. I think that's happening all around. Thanks very much for that, Francis. I'm just going to outlay a few things which are happening in the news. And I just want to see where you take them in terms of whether they're relevant or whether you think you can disregard them for the time being. So one thing that I noticed recently in London real estate, I saw this in the news, the most expensive regions were, this is a very short time frame, but it went down by 0.6% per month. Do you say that's one canary in the coal mine or would you just say this is not enough information for now? What's happened in the London property market at the moment is A, prices have slipped, particularly in prime. And this is the worry. You always have to look at the prime, the extreme prime and prime market. That's the, when I say prime, that's the, you know, the expensive stuff. Yeah. So the margin, the at margin buyer of the high wealth that was utilizing London. Some will say, oh, but that's a Brexit effect. You're no longer part of the EU zone. Well, actually, we have English law and all of that. People like that. They come there. You know, that China comes there not because we're part of the EU zone, but people will, you know, attach it to a current event. The Saudi Arabian prince as well comes over. Exactly. Exactly. And he's not overly concerned um, whether it's, it's EU. He wants to keep money in a different geography, yeah. which has strong property right law. And the UK is that, and it's central for pan-European travel and other things. So what's central to that is the volume has dropped. So price, now now you would say, but in the blow-off, it goes up. Yes, it does, but after that, it drops. It drops very low initially, and then there's a panic, and then it tries to be high, but prices can collapse on very thin volume. And housing is slightly different. So what happens in housing is, as yet, we haven't had the crisis that creates forced sellers. Right. Property is an asset class where there's financial engineering and leverage involved. And the thing that causes the quick capitulation, the panic, is the natural event that leads to forced sellers. So the wholesale crisis in Lehman's and the entire Lehman financial bankers community being laid off and a flood of available bankers to be recruited by other banks all knocking bonuses and salaries in their own and shoring up their own damaged balance sheets, that knocked an entire industry, which is often part and parcel, a large percentage makeup of the prime market. Yep. So you haven't had the triggering event. What you've got is the setup. Yep. You've got the setup, but you haven't yet had the triggering event. Now, people will always blame the triggering event as the reason, but the whole reason is the over financially engineered market, the setup. The lunatic is running up and down the edge of the cliff. We're just waiting for him to slip on the wet grass, which invariably will happen. But he has to run a few times until he misfoots. And that's your triggering event. People will then say it was the misfooting that killed him rather than the situation that was created that saw him doing something reckless and dangerous with a high probability of leading it to a negative outcome. So we're in that state where in Britain, people have been trained, and I think this is, applies to the Australian market as well, is that you don't sell property, it's a sure thing. Yes. So what actually happens is volume goes exceedingly low because everybody else holds on and only forced sellers sell. Now, forced sellers can be someone who needs to practically move for reasons of normal job, geographic change, job, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Fine. That's one thing. But there's none of the traditional sales markets. And then 
it's trading lower because there's still a relative oversupply and the buyers who have means to buy are less. So it says the market is underpinned. It's kind of like the cartoon character, the you know the roadrunner that runs off the wolf coyote who chases the roadrunner birds runs off the cliff, and for a period he's being sustained by virtually nothing, because there hasn't been a complete mania panic triggering event. So the volume is not under him, and then he looks down and he sees he's run off the cliff, and then he collapses. And that what's going to make the market look down, kind of comes down to the the query. So as yet, we haven't got that triggering event, but we've got the full setup for it to occur. So it's just a matter of time. I think the unique thing about that article is that rather than, say, the Lehman's crisis, where you had the subprime, the poor loan, the the substandard loans, which were being defaulted on, that was pulling, say, the cards away from the bottom. Whereas this seems to be like price pressure from the top half of the pyramid. With the London house prices, it's a bit different here because this is the very richest, the most elite areas, your Westminster, which is going down in value. Yeah. And I always thought that the the reason why London prices are going so high was because the, the rich people were bidding higher and higher. So there was like a distribution going down to the middle expense loans and then the next ones after that. So it had a trickle down effect to the rest of the market, which made... London in general so expensive rather than there being like the bottom being pulled out of the pyramid this is happening from the top and I just wondered if this is a different way that the bubble could pop it can certainly pop from the top and it can also unravel from both ends the real low end is not strong as well the really low end is not strong you can unravel from the fringes often what has actually happened is that the British government successively have also treated the property market as the goose that lays the golden eggs and has continually sought to harvest it for tax revenue purposes. When I first arrived here, regardless of the value of the property, that the transfer tax was 1%, Yeah, you know, the registration tax. Now on the super prime, you pay a million pound on a seven million pound property straight to the government in tax. So they went to the introducing bans where it was one to three and, and then three to five. And I haven't kept up with this because I've not been active in the property market during the last five or six years. But the latest bans are ridiculous. So you can see you're over a million pound on a seven million pound home. Now, you might be saying shame for the poor guy at seven million pounds. But you also have noticed that the lenders are less generous now on the super property because they don't like overexposure. So they've got a bit of portfolio theory. They don't want one or two major bomb outs in any one loan. So they've only been doing up to 50%. So even for a rich guy who's getting, you know, is on 250,000 basic and a 1.5 million bonus banker, you know, he'd be a sort of senior vice president, something of a US bank or a Swiss bank. You still got to find that money. They're not what I'd call the uber wealthy, where it's the, they're worth extreme hundreds of millions. So to buy at those levels and to pay a million pound in tax and only to get 50% now on loans does mean there's the banks have also been a little bit cautious on the prime. So they've withdrawn a small amount of liquidity uh, in terms of the leverage they've allowed. And then the government has come in and has added a lot of taxation on it. So that's the other thing that Australia will find. The temptation for uh, successive governments to see this as the holy grail, as long as it keeps going and it's the big easy, government's going to want a piece of that. Yeah. So they're going to start creeping rates and taxes might be another way they'd hit it or what they call council tax here. In other words, to have your rubbish picked up and all of that, that might go up and you get banding into new levels or they might relook at that or they just push up the stamp duty, which is what they've done over here, transaction costs. So those are other reasons why that might be slowing as well. Yeah. I think the basis of where I'm trying to take us here is through a number of different black swan events. I just want to just outline a few that I've noticed and highlighted. You've got these big titans like Deutsche Bank. They're in peril now. And I just see that that's an interesting aspect because they're no longer in a position to maybe lobby anymore. Also, I'm noticing that there's some other articles coming out. I noticed that HSBC said that there is a massive price pressure potentially on the US stock market. So I think they forecast something like a 70% drop, which is like dramatic that might be happening with the buyback bubble there. Also, I noticed that Goldman Sachs issued a warning as well about the Chinese real estate. So we know about the shadow banking system and the ghost cities there as well. 
Is there any area there that you find significant or are these already bubbles that which are ready to go? Every place where there's been financial engineering and leveraging up, if you have a look at margin lending in US stocks, the percent that that's been going on, we're at all time highs. Last time I had a, a peak of just getting a, while you were speaking, I just Googled a chart there to see how, how current I can get something. Since 1995, whoops, and it's, uh, you know, it's at epic levels. So any place which involves the banking system where leverage is provided, it's a bubble spotter's paradise. The bond market is probably the biggest bubble and it is coming off. And now we're seeing Goldman Sachs articles saying, you know, even a slight spike in interest rates could see 1.1 trillion, trillion with a T, which most people don't conceptualize in size at all, coming off the primary Barclays gold fund. But it becomes exceedingly sensitive to interest rates. As you go from 1% to half a percent, that is almost a doubling in the bond market's power. But if you go the other way, it becomes very sensitive in, in the moves. Because we've got in such low increments, the percentage moves are actually quite vast when you have swings in the bond market. And because we're sizing up as we're going down, when you get a small spike in the opposite way, it becomes more critical. It's kind of like putting your hand in the cookie jar and you expand and try grab all the peppermints or the cookies. You can't get it back out because you're scaling up when you go back down. Getting back out just to the same level becomes a huge problem. So there are bubbles everywhere. The bond market for me is probably the biggest one. The stock market is hopelessly overpriced. And I think the plan from the control structure and the cabal that is the central bankers, as long as they can maintain the stock market, which is such a bellwether indicator, although I would argue that there's much bigger markets that should be, but because it's established and the US has a stock market culture, as long as they maintain that largely at a reasonably high level, they keep the facade And it's like a facade of the building. You know, when they sometimes do architecture and they insist on it being retained, you have the facade, which is literally one wall, and then there's nothing behind it, just bricks and mortar and a wreck waiting to come back out the ground. I feel like our entire economy is a structural facade. There's this beautiful Louis XV arch and all of this artistry, and there's no building behind it. It's just rubble behind it. Uh, But people aren't recognizing that yet. And it's all over the place. And it's the banking system. It's the leverage in the banking system. When we spoke on our preview, you know, I pointed out that there's scope. This is where Harry Dent is largely accurate, that we have to have first a deflation. You know, all these digits that have been created in computers have to melt away in asset value reval because we reach the point where it's no longer sustainable. And even the super rich don't believe it, which is another reason why I think the top end of the London property market is cautious. They're some of the smartest minds. These people make money for a living, you know, and they've proven very good at it. They know a stinky asset class when they see one, so they're not buying on it. So the facades are starting to show that there's nothing behind it. People are peering behind the curtain. And it's almost like there's, a, as you say, there's this parallel universe. And this is what I was referring to. All the little sales girls saying, yes, you get 1500 rent in Manchester on an apartment. There's tons of people earning big salaries to pay that over here. There's 5,000 apartments in the supply line and they'll all get that. The narrative just starts to diverge. The credibility of the narrative starts to diverge so far away from what the reality is. And the Federal Reserve is in that space right now. Some of the comments they're making now are just laughable and ludicrous. If they're not the plain obvious, they are complete disinformation. In other words, it just looks like an utter disconnect. That's a warning sign when narratives start disconnecting from reality and you can painfully see that. We had Fisher saying, you know, there's danger to high rates. Well, tell me about it. You know, if they start stating the bleeding obvious, what are they actually saying? We're in a precarious situation and any rate rises that we've been threatening, we'll do going to have a marked effect on a number of asset classes and a lot of banks and like Deutsche Bank and US banks, which are also in a terrible state. It's a long answer, but this is just precariousness. Everything about this echoes facade and precariousness to me and lack of credibility from the control structure. In other words, the narrative of passing away. I wouldn't want to be the guy who's having to carry the current governmental control structure line in this market environment because everyone is calling BS on them. Absolutely. Now, uh, I'm going to try and represent that person and give you the hopeful narrative. And I'm just going to see how you'd like to come back at this. So I'm the central banker. This is our plan. We're going to increase the money supply. 
and this will really negate the effect of all these loans. Once we increase the money supply, then it's going to be like, uh, you know, when the UK had to pay the war debt to America, they eventually just paid it off. Marshall Plan. Yeah, and they just paid it off in drips and drabs, and it was literally ineffective after a while. So there's a method to inflate our way out of this mess. How would you come back at that? Well, they've already done that. And an economic fact is the economic activity is the velocity of money moving around the system as well as the amount of it. And what's happened is velocity has been slowing because people, A, don't have it to spend and they're barely making ends to meet and they're having to pay more and they're having to earn more. And there is what I call that bipolar type economy that's highly stagflationary for the 99% where actual costs are actually higher than the represented inflation rate. And they are in fear because most people now that I speak to, I used to talk about this reset being imminent and people thought I was a loon. Now most people have heard or have some fear or concern. So that velocity is not there. People aren't, there is no feel good factor for the the bulk of the economy and the bulk of the people. So that velocity isn't there. Now you can continue to create more of the money, but what actually happens is the way people are responding is, You're just making me more afraid something's going to go wrong and my velocity dips in a proportionate level and perhaps even more. I mentioned in the preview clip as well that you get a diminishing return effect from creating more money. In a sense, when it first happened, it was like water to parched earth. Now you are actually committing soil erosion and there's nothing but negativity by what you're doing. It's not being retained. It's having a one-off hit effect and then it's draining away and you're leaving the situation worse than before you did it. So it's kind of like chemotherapy. You know, you're worse for the treatment for resisting cancer after that first session than not having had it at all because now your immune system is shot as well. So now you need more, more regularly and stronger till eventually the chemotherapy is replacing that which is fighting the tumors. Your own body has no resistance at all and that's unsustainable and eventually you die. And in essence, that's my answer to you. The velocity will respond by reducing. And also that money, that liquidity in terms of whom it's being provided to so far has mainly gone through via the banking system, which isn't giving it to you or I or the 99 percenters on any scale. Banks aren't seeding entrepreneurial businesses to go have a go in this economic environment and saying, you everyday guy, go on, you go start your, you know, my motorbike servicing business and you over there, you go, it isn't an entrepreneurial revolution. This this is goes to the financial engineering people. And they've always treated property as safe as houses. So it'll go into a property market lending portfolio where it's being speculated by the investment banking arms. So they keep on keeping on. And the distortion just extends because it's going into the same place and denying even further the other. Yet it does have a slightly stagflationary effect and is reducing the borrowing power of the 99%. So they feel the poorer for it and they spend even less. So let's just say we put you in charge. We've made you Chancellor of the Exchequer for the UK. How would you get the UK out of its mess? I would become the most unpopular uh, (laughs) Chancellor of the Exchequer ever existed. I would force us into an immediate and brutal recession. Right. I'd try to restore original value of money and concept of balance books. The notion is politically I would be completely politically unpalatable. So I'd be dismissed in my first week as a loon for my ideas. And I'm okay with that. The whole concept is I would seek to do very much what Iceland did right, on a far bigger scale. And that was rebalance the economy away from being extreme financial. The control structure simply wouldn't allow it because they've decided that London is, from a heritage point of view, is large part. But I would certainly look to develop other industry and other skill sets. And I would reduce the leverage and speculate game, which is just perpetuating the extremity of our situation at the moment. The one thing I see as a little bit of a problem with that is that we're kind of playing financial chicken. We're like driving head on with each other. Neither of us want to be the first person to veer off because if we do the reset, then all of our beautiful assets start to go for fire sell prices. And then China sweeps in and starts to buy all the beautiful places that we possess. And then it's literally the country becomes a foreign owned place. The first mover in this scenario is invariably would be seen as the, as you know, the the idiot, uh, I think, even though I think it would be the the right thing to do. And for that reason, people wouldn't want to see their country reflected as, as, you know, the trouble, the sick man of Europe again. 
um, which is why, as I say, it, it would probably be unpalatable. But the first to go through it will be the first to go out yeah. and will be the first to show it. You know Iceland are out of it. Say, so, well, it's 300,000 people on a little polar cap island, but nonetheless, it is a microcosm and was over leveraged in very much the same way. This is a perpetuated zombie economy state that we're in. And the only reason we're in it is everyone is sick and looking at everyone else and asking who's going to die first so that I don't have to be the clown who gets tagged as Greece of the EU experiment. And everyone is sitting there getting yellower and more jaundiced and looking at each other like the outpatients area for the Alcoholics Anonymous and wondering who's going to topple over first. And the sooner you start a detox, the better your likelihood of survival. People will continue to pour ever greater amounts of alcohol, heroin, or whatever, the things that caused the original problem, getting less of a hit out of it, needing hyperbolically more. So money creation is inflation. Yes. The fact that you haven't seen it, inf- the price is rising is a symptom of it that comes afterward. The fact that you know, you've been poisoning your liver and as yet it doesn't show externally doesn't mean it isn't happening. So if you look at that Fed money creation graph that went absolutely hyperbolic from the 2008 curve, that's your inflation. The only reason you're not seeing it in an excessive sense in the price action, I believe you are seeing it more than you realize than they are saying you're seeing it. It's been like global dimming has counteracted global warming. The pollution has in effect deflected some of the sun away. You're getting an effect that there's been a deflationary effect by the reduced velocity of money moving around and and economic activity. So it's been counteracted slightly. Yeah. It's kind of the winds in both directions are blowing ever harder, but they are counteracting each other. But the pressure on you caught in the middle is getting a lot higher. You're being squeezed from behind and pushed from the front. And that's the powerful degree of forces. And those forces will only increase. And that's the crushing effect that we get. They may be in balance, but if you're being absolutely pummeled on both sides, it's not a comforting place to be. Absolutely. Just one thing I was thinking off the top of my head here is that you know that there is an anti-globalization movement and there's more patriotism and nationalism, national pride. Maybe the people start to sense that this system does need a reset. And the only way to reset it is to get a very nationalistic leader taking control, saying that we're going to default on our bonds, we're going to work together, crash the economy and do the great reset again and start to price allocate properly. Would you say there's some kind of truth behind that? I think there is a greater awareness amongst the people about the unnatural state of the economic system. What concerns me is that the people controlling the expression of that discontent will guide it as to where it must be directed and will take them down false hangouts, a controlled hangout of outcome which is not correct. For example, we can say capitalism is at fault. Capitalism isn't at fault at all. We're not experiencing capitalism. We're experiencing corporatism and oligarchical insider cartel corporate ideology. We're not seeing free flow of capital. So you get a lot of anti-capitalists. Don't confuse capitalism as an economic system with the banking cartel and brokers and bond salesmen and governments proliferating debt. Capitalism doesn't say go mad and proliferate debt at a hyperbolic rate. That's not official. What you have is the human factor within a capitalistic structure have removed the stabilizers, the limitations, so that they could rev the nuts off the engine and break the car. And then everyone blames the car. It had natural stabilizers. You, as a human, got greedy and wanted to go faster for longer in worse conditions than you should be doing. And as a result, you broke a very perfectly good vehicle that was designed to run for a very long time. You know, the price discovery system of supply and demand is a good system, yeah. providing it's allowed to function and there's no intervention by an abnormally sized force that can get political wherewithal by controlling that price mechanism or treat it as a mood indicator for the safety of the economy and say it only goes up, like the stock market in the US. The problem is the interventionisms of government. We are actually in communism more than a free price discovery mechanism world, in my view. In other words, government's involved in everything. I mentioned the British government buying surplus apartments from developers here. I've had other people in the States saying the Fed will buy anything. We've got the EU buying corporate bonds. Yeah. Since when do they determine which industries should have their debt supported by government? 
since when is it government's business to buy VW corporate bonds? Yeah. Why should they be intervening and keeping those asset prices up? With my tax money? How does it help me and my society? So they've extended too big to fail from a financial system. You know, you had in the US, the two car manufacturers going bust, getting support, mainly because of their financing houses. Yeah. You know, GMAC was one I mentioned already in the analogy. So they were bailing out essentially the financial, which means they're actually bailing out car companies now. So anything that has a big employment that's politically expedient, government has an interest in. Government doesn't vote ever for sizing down. Absolutely. So I just wanted to see if we can push out any glimmer of hope that we can avoid this crisis. The only other area I can see that where we might be able to steer and turn away from a crisis that's going to be an ultra hard reset is that there's some kind of economic boom that happens in some kind of industry. So, you know, throughout years, we've had like the oil boom, we've had the computer technology boom. Do you see that there's any kind of revolution that could happen around the corner? Could AI technology and deep learning give us a boost in some way? Or do you think that there's no way that any of this can pick us up and pull us through? I believe that, I love that actually, there was an Onion article, Americans wish to know what's the next bubble that they can chase. The problem with that is that all the most obvious, easy to leverage ones have been done. Right. We're into subprime cars and subprime student loans at the moment. You know, housing's been done. Yes, they did a bit of an echo rebalance, but people have seen this movie before in this asset class. They're stupid to a degree, but not that stupid. There's a weariness about it. And there's a weariness within the banks as well. We're already into the more dubious assets of education where people are probably studying basket weaving and God knows what, and some aren't even going and they're just treating it as a cheap personal loan and massive write-offs in that space, which will almost become a social issue, which will then lead to them getting write-downs. That just means they've given money. So in some senses, you can argue there's helicopter money going in because those institutions will be bailed out. The major tech boom that's going to cover for the extremely overextended bottom market. The bubbles have been pushed in so many places, in all the big obvious places, that they exceed anything in dimension of such huge scale. You know, the share markets are only about, I think it's a seventh of the debt markets, and the FX market is about double the debt markets on top of it. Bonds are the big problem. That's why I mentioned it. Uh, Government debt. Everyone used to think. And I used to, I grew up thinking for every pound in debt or dollar or rand in debt, there was a saver that was provided. The creation of money doesn't work like that. In other words, every nation is overly indebted. So there's no one saver nation. Yes, you can argue about trade deficits in terms of who's buying more of whose stuff for a while, but they're all over in debt. China did a massive debt ramp to just give us that heat in the economy from 08, 09 up to 11. And then we started to roll that 14, the oil broke, the copper broke, and all the charts that we were calling the end of the commodity boom broke. So it's not going to be a commodity because they've been spanked and they're in real trouble. Oil is stirring slightly, but it's not going to reverse like it went down. Things don't climb like they capitulate. Yeah, I would accept what is absolutely inevitable, almost on balance of probability, and instead ask, how do I come out of this position so well that I have a quantum leap in my relative wealth? Because wealth is something you need to measure in relative terms. The number's going to swing wildly for gold prices. And you know, when things deflate, what used to be a million pound could be 200,000 pounds. In relative wealth, how do I position best for the eventualities that are highly probable? to come out of this with a great gain in eventual wealth. Because those who position well for what is going to happen will be the ones that will go into the next cycle at a totally different level. And then you can be acquiring land when it's giveaway money. You can be acquiring and you can be doing everything. And in actual fact, the crisis is the biggest opportunity. But most people are underprepared for how to exploit the crisis and will be part of the masses because they will end up Pavlovian responses which is the greed and fear, which is the 91%. My big free trading webinar that I, it's an hour and a half, says don't be the 91%. Yeah. You know, the 91% lose, learn to become the 9%. And the problem is those without a plan will respond in a reactionary basis. And your Pavlovian response is exactly the wrong response. So it's greed and fear. And in this case, it'll be fear. So the question is, how do I have the plan in advance and stick to the plan when everyone else is doing one thing that looks smart? I'm already positioned there. I've got to be early. So if the thing is to hoard cash, don't try to hoard cash when everyone else is going to do it. There's going to be scarcity. 
<laughs> if the game is to hoard gold, don't try to do it when everyone else is doing it um, because it's going to be bloody expensive and there's going to be none of it around. There's going to be supply shortages and there's going to be more fraudulent bars and all sorts of perils. So you've got to be a step ahead. And for that, you have to have been a futurist, looked forward and put in action your plan for coming out of this well. And you have to have studied history and looked at the models. And that's the question I'm most interested in answering. Absolutely. We're going to definitely go into that in more detail later on. But I guess the hopeful narrative is for the masses. But when it comes to the individual, there is epic opportunity. So we're going to move on to the medium term just now. So I'd see some things that are developing right now and maybe in a year's time, these are going to start to manifest. I just want to get your thoughts with the bond market because it can seem pretty confusing, but it's, it's really debt issuance between corporations and governments. But with a bond bear market, we've been, I don't know how many years now, maybe 30 years plus that we've been in a, a lovely ball cycle. What happens when we go into the bear phase? Disorderly decline. I think it will be such a disorderly decline of such scale that there will be a need to distract us from the extent of the effects of this. And, you know, you listen to Krugman and other outriders of the insider cabal, and, you know, I'm shocked with the blaseness they refer to how war is actually good for economies. One way to create a whole bunch of heat in an economy that is coming out of depression, bear in mind the 20s into the early 30s of the US particularly, War sure as hell gets everybody working. Yeah. It also requires a immense amount of debt. It does leverage up. And given the extent that we over leveraged, I'm not sure we have the same capacity to further leverage on that. I think in the depression years, there was that scope initially. I fear that the whole reset will get masked by socio and geopolitical events of which do feel a big global conflict is a great risk, which maybe being in Australia or even New Zealand is not a bad place because I think this is invariably going to involve the big powers of potentially, and this is not a prediction and I wouldn't want to be accurate if this was, but I do have to say that on balance probabilities of these outcomes are higher than normal. Yeah. Russia, China, US, and Europe caught in the middle in it all. It would be big in scale. Definitely. With a bond bear market, I know this is an impossible thing to mention, but how do you see things like mortgage rates? What territory could they go into when you're in a bear market? The deflation model, which I am probably most favored on balance of probability to happen initially before any out and out high inflationary could break out, the deflation model would see a restriction on lending, which would see banks doing defensive things, which would have a collateralized freezing up of the market. So it does sound a lot like 2008 again, potentially the scale just being a lot larger. So Deutsche Bank, for example, as an institution, dwarfs Lehman's yeah. in its significance to the home market and globally. And it's not the only one sick, it's just probably one of the sickest the magic circle all hold hands, you know, the primary dealers. So they all switch off liquidity to whoever they decide is the weakest. So you've got all these anemic looking alcoholics with yellow skin looking at each other, wondering who's going to die first. And the minute they spot one, they turn on them like piranhas. They switch off the liquidity and they stop doing business and won't transfer money through. And then that individual institution is ostracized. And then the government and the too big to fail mentality comes back. Do we let it go? Was the big mistake letting Lehman's go or was it the right thing to do? All of these debates come back into play and you end up, you know, we had a George Bush situation where literally he wasn't trusted to even read the teleprompter correctly on the financial side. And Hank Paulson was effectively having all the behind the scenes meetings and making all the major decisions. We could revisit that very closely. History, you know, it's recent and it's lazy to say it'll be the, exactly the same. I don't think it'll be the same. I think it'll be far larger. The Pavlovian response of fear for bankers will be the same as it is for people. Yeah. Once someone is so sick, they will say, well, we have to be seen to act responsibly. But I think what's happening now is they're talking to a far higher level to government. So government keeps propping up the sick one and saying we'll be there behind closed doors. Maybe even they'll say it publicly. I don't know. So they keep propping it up and saying, we'll do all we can. You know, you might remember Draghi saying anything it takes at one point when he killed the euro from 1.4 down to its current levels, you know, to create inflation and to give support to the euro. In other words, Greece, we're not having it leaving. It's a captive. We aren't letting this show unravel on us. We'll do anything it takes. I think the mentality in government is 
you know, this is the end game. They're going to throw everything and the kitchen sink rather than have another Lehman situation. And eventually it ends up, they're so overextended, you can't help it. There's so many sick alcoholics that are so drunk that have now been given so much extra booze, they're all ready to fall over and they all can collectively fall over. How do you mask that? Well, you throw a hand grenade in another room and get everyone to look elsewhere and then say, look at this, it's all caused this, bang, bosh, we, you know, New Bretton Woods agreement. We've got to start all over. This is this war caused this and, you know, a, a whole bunch of stuff's gone down. Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to try and piece together a probable or a possible future scenario. So let's just say this is going to cover a light geopolitics now. So we've got China and USA. Trump is, I think he's gone down a little bit in the polls recently, but let's just say that he comes to power. Now, how do these situations transpire? So you have both nations sitting on huge credit bubbles. You have China with less public debt, but potentially more gold reserves. China has been a net importer. You have Donald Trump, who states that there should be some kind of balance of trade when you are exchanging goods. So he states that whereas China's buying US treasuries to keep their yarn low, that's not happening really. Their currency should be appreciating so that there should be a give and take in the markets. So maybe Donald Trump will go by a, a taxation route and maybe put in embargoes, protectionist policies. Potentially that will participate into China counteracting by dumping treasuries. And this is all going on while there's a China Sea conflict and the US is trying to promote all the other little countries by defending the alleged islands which are located on a map. So how does that all happen where the dumping of the treasuries, the US, the only power that they've got is to trash the dollar. Once you do that, you've trash in the purchasing power of the people at the same time. So how do you see that all pieced together? Yeah, the chronology and how it'll go. I don't think it's going to make a huge difference to the outcome of the event. So, you know, as the question you are asking, you know, is there any chance something miracle can happen that we don't go through this process? It's kind of like saying, can we hold back the night? And we're in the remains of the day period and you don't hold back the night. You plan for it and you get your sleeping bags and torches and things. In essence, I don't think Trump or Hillary will hold back the tide. In other words, I believe they're both part of control structure. There is stylistically differences to them. If anything, Hillary is the more militaristic and the more aggressive towards Russia, but that's not to call Trump a peacemaker either. The style varies, but I don't think the person holds that much power as we believe. I think the behind the curtain is the real power. So we will go through this process regardless of the election outcome. With regards to other points you made, such as the South China Sea and, you know, America trying to get involved, this I see as flagrant signs of the final economic tool, which is not directly in the economic tool bag, but is military. And I pointed out that over the last four or five years, Rayathon, Lockheed Martin, Babcock, BAE, General Dynamics, all these companies have gone up between four and five times since the lows of the post-2000, a huge, who are the clients to these companies? Government. It's almost like it's an economic tool and that quantitative easing in the too big to fail banks, an immense amount of government debt has also been created. Believe you me, the tax revenues only cover half the payments in the US. That's at ridiculously low interest rates. That's why I say there is no way back. At next to nothing interest rates, they're only making half the payments. That's a bit like me saying this is the most you'll ever earn and you can only afford half the payment on your car. You've got a bubble payment you're going to run into at some point. You know, it's coming. You can't hide from that fact. And the four years is almost up and the asset is not worth anything near what you got it. There's a crunch. So I see the militarization as an economic tool. So might eventually becomes right when the digits in the computer all go wrong and you've got the deflation and all of that. And there's this massive social unrest. It's going to be quite autocratic and it's going to be quite militaristic and the relations will break down globally. So you will have a bit of a reverse globalization effect. Yeah. When everyone realizes that it's a zero sum game, they all start trying to grab as much of the pie for themselves. That's why nationalistic trade barriers come in. All things that have been tried before and fail. So the great globalization boom that we got, you then end up with a shrinking pizza size for everyone trying to conserve their slice actually ends up spoiling the whole industry. 
So it's a bit like you and I are competitors in an industry. And instead of trying to grow the collective industry, we talk smack about each other and what thieves and frauds the other guys are until we turn the industry into a pariah industry that no one wants to utilize their products or services on. And we actually collectively, through virtue of competing and small-mindedness, destroy our own respective businesses. A reverse globalization effect will have this. So either way I look at that, that points to shrinkage and deflation and Pavlovian responses to fear and greed and trying to do solutions that have been done before because there's political pressure to do them. And strong people don't exist. When there's political pressure, people secede to protectionism. Yeah. You say, we're suffering. You've got to protect our car workers. Okay, we'll do it for them. But, you know, we don't want to go down this road. Oh, but then now you've also got to protect the following workers, et cetera, et cetera. And then you start doing it. And then the other people saying, you're protecting your workers there. So we're going to protect in our industry here because you're selling stuff to our industry. We could have more domestic consumption of our own goods. And then there's a tit for tat. There's no one big who says, I aren't doing this. I ain't playing. Just like there's no one big to say, we need to take a proper recession and clear out all the mal investments. In the same way I was describing to you, I wouldn't last long yeah. because everybody wants to be the sick man and keep pouring the booze down in the throat. They don't want to say, sod it, it's cold turkey time. This is going to be hard, guys. This is the truth of it, but we've got to take this dive. The longer we leave it, the harder it'll be. The political responses, which are always just meet the need of the crying voice, the squeaky wheel getting the oil, will continue to perpetuate a global irresponsible, the, the things that are net bad for the total system. And so we reverse the benefit of the globalization where Walmart kept prices low because China was making everything and doing it at a real low cost per price. So you get the reverse Goldilocks effect of Greenspan. Greenspan had a productivity miracle accordingly, pumped lots of cash and there was no inflation. Why? Because we had globalization and costs were kept low by other providers. Now you get the reverse effect. You're going to have cash being drained away and you're getting stubbornly high stagflation of rates and things costing more and more. And what do they do? They do protectionism. So instead of getting the cheap items anymore, you pay more for a locally derived item. You're going to get even more stagflation and even more pain. So it's just all the wrong decisions will be taken. And to start off with, even if you took all the best for the quickest pain, the harshest probably, but the quickest pain to recovery, no one would do that because it's just simply not politically expedient. Absolutely. Okay, so that's nation state versus nation state to a degree. Purchasing power is more to do with the question of the people and its subjects with the government. So all the countries around the world are complicit in devaluing their currency to have some kind of competitive edge. Now, do you see a point in which the public start? Can I pause you on that part of that question? Sure. Can you see how you've already accepted that at a currency level, that everyone is bigger than neighbor for destroying their currency to have a relative export advantage over the other and that there's a dash to trash. Absolutely, yeah. Can you see if they're already behaving like that in that one area, that when the nuts get squeezed a little bit harder in that vice, that that same behavior pattern will repeat itself. In other words, human nature has to be allowed to play itself out at its lowest common denominator level Yes. of natural response to the emotional uh, stimuluses, which will be pain. Absolutely, yeah. And you will all trade like the 91%, just doing the natural thing and doing what everyone else does and all of that. It's going to be exceedingly hard to be the one that does the wisdom road. Unfortunately, we had to finish halfway through this question. I'd like to thank Francis for his participation on this interview. Please keep your eye out for part two, where we'll analyze the future events and Francis will shed some light on how to prepare.